Open your Bibles, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Next week, I'm going to be starting a new uh, four part series in the book of Psalms called You, Not Me, The Heart of Worship. Today, though, we're going to uh, camp out in 2 Timothy chapter 4 for a bit. While you're turning there, let me, let me tell you an interesting story. It was February 2006. Running back Jerome Bettis, affectionately known as the bus, grinned and declared to the world, I played this game to win the championship. I'm a champion, and I think that the bus's last stop is here in Detroit. I'm the happiest person in the world. It's all over. There aren't any games left. And in front of a TV audience of millions standing on a platform filled by the Super Bowl 40 champion Pittsburgh Steelers. He jubilantly hoisted high the Lombardi Trophy, which was, you know, the the crowning achievement of his career. See, Jerome Bettis had the pleasure of not only finishing his NFL career in his hometown and of going out as a champion, but also the joy of the view from the end zone of his playing career. Not not the literal end zone, uh, but the end zone as it stands as a symbol of victory and and accomplishment. For us, the the end zone is uh, symbolic of of life's finish lines. It's goal lines. Symbolic of the ultimate achievement. Well, I want to take a few minutes this morning to, to contrast the bus with shall we say, the Paul. Um, Today's text actually finds the Apostle Paul in the the end zone of his life, so to speak. But it's not the setting that you would imagine. In fact, it's the uh, first century somewhere around the mid to late 60s in the first century. Paul was writing 2 Timothy during his second imprisonment, uh, this time in a Roman dungeon, a prisoner for the sake of the gospel. He's facing the capital charge of insurrection. He's expecting... Uh, the verdict of execution by Emperor Nero. <coughs> Christy, do me a favor. Bring me that bottle of water right there. <coughs> I am so glad I brought her. <laughs> of course, I realize, you know, last uh, June when you voted to call me as pastor, you were really calling her, and I was just kind of icing on the cake. But uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so... He's facing this verdict of execution by Emperor Nero. He knows that the end of his life is close at hand. And yet he still has his eyes on the prize. He's anticipating a crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy was the last epistle that Paul would ever write. It's his final instructions. In some ways it even reads like his, his last will and testament. And in it, he passes the gospel banner to his young protege, Timothy, and charges him to preach the word of God to a world that is lost and dying. But you see, not only has this letter given Timothy valuable counsel, but in writing it, Paul has also given us some valuable applications for our lives as Christians today. So I want you to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 5 together. Beginning in verse 5, Paul writes, But as for you, exercise self-control in everything. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time for my departure is close. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who have loved his appearing. So for Paul, the view literally was from the finish line of his life. And he had his eyes on a heavenly prize. So I want to focus this morning... on three points of practical counsel that we receive from Paul in his letter to Timothy here. Okay, three things. Number one is this. Run the course. Run the course. Look at the end of verse 5. Fulfill your ministry. 
He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is close. Fulfill your ministry. Run your course. It's sound counsel, both for Timothy and the then and there, and for you and I and the here and now. Now, some of you are thinking, what is my course? You know, how do I know what he's calling me to? Well, my response to that is, have you asked him? As I reflect back on my life, you know, my, my young adult years were just a meandering mess. I mean, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. In college, I changed my major three times, okay? Started off as a music major, did that for a year, I realized I couldn't cut it. Uh, changed to Bible. I was a Bible major for a year. Uh, then I was an evangelism major. That lasted for a semester. Then I thought, oh my word, I'm three years into college and I still don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. So I switched to speech communication and theater. Okay, now my, my Bachelor of Arts degree, my diploma in speech and theater, yeah, that's worth about as much as an outdated Pizza Hut coupon. I'm just going to tell you right now. But <laughs> I changed my major three times. I, I transferred between schools. I mean, I knew from the moment I was 16 years old, I mean, I knew that I was called for some form of vocational service, but I just didn't know what that was. And you know why? Because I did not ask. I did not get down on my knees and fervently, persistently seek the heart of God to ask him, God, what sort of ministry do you want me to be doing? And I was also too dumb to know that calling, the calling that God puts on your life, that's not necessarily a subjective thing. You know, it doesn't have to be some, some mystical experience complete with a vision where, where God drops a neon sign down out of heaven that says, Eric, do this! It, it, it doesn't have to be that at all. You know, oftentimes it's just a simple matter of taking inventory of your gifts the abilities that God's given you, and then asking God, how can I use these to make the maximum impact for your kingdom? Folks, find out what you're good at. Seriously, find out what you're good at. I mean, whether you're a banker or a, a lawyer, a, a musician, a, a medical equipment salesman, a, a grocer, a teacher, whatever you're good at, Use that to make a big deal out of God and do it every day. And you will find that you are fulfilling your calling. Do it every day. Now, I want you to notice a couple things that Paul talks about here in verse 6. The first thing is the drink offering. Paul's making a reference here to an Old Testament ritual. It was part of the observance of the Day of Atonement. Now, according to the Levitical law, when a worshiper's burnt offering was consumed by fire, the worshiper would often pour wine, a drink offering of wine, upon those, those coals, those burning coals. And it would create a sweet aroma. And of course, the symbolism of that actually points us forward from Leviticus all the way to the Gospels. To the Lord Jesus pouring out his soul, his very life, dying for us. But here, Paul is declaring that his very life is an offering that's been completely poured out in sweet service to the Lord. And as I ponder that, I think, what must it look like to see a person whose life is completely poured out in sacrifice? to a cause. Now, if you've been in the Baptist church for very long, you, you can't listen to many Baptist preachers without hearing one of them talk about Charles Haddon Spurgeon. So, C.H. Spurgeon, Spurgeon, in order to deal with the needs of ministry in London, he, the pastor of Metropolitan Tabernacle, established a number of different uh, charitable organizations. Uh, today we would call them para-church ministries. Uh, Sixty-six of them in all. Among these were two orphanages, a book fund, a clothing drive, uh, numerous alms houses, uh, think 19th century Habitat for Humanity, uh, a retirement home, nursing home, uh, Sunday schools for children, Sunday schools for the blind, ministries to fallen women, ministries to policemen, a theological college, 
and much, much more. Now, Spurgeon also built a massive publishing ministry. In fact, by 1892, Charles Haddon Spurgeon had published more words in the English language than any other Christian in history. And through preaching and print, it's estimated that during the course of his life, Charles Haddon Spurgeon shared the gospel with an estimated 10 million people. Hey, this is 19th century, folks. There's no internet, there's no television, radio, no satellite. 10 million people. And total sales of Spurgeon's books uh, adjusted for inflation to match today's dollar were the equal of $26,144,925.33. And yet Spurgeon died poor, having funneled every penny possible back into the ministries of Metropolitan Tabernacle. Those ministries that he and his wife so tirelessly maintained. That's a life that's poured out in service to God. So what is Paul saying here in verses 5 and 6 that really might apply to us? It's pretty obvious. Run your course. Pour out your life. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul also refers to himself not just as an offering, but also as a journeyman, a traveler who is preparing to depart this earth. And you know what? Like Paul, every believer has a path in life that he or she must run, a calling, a course that God has called us to. In verse 5, Paul instructs Timothy, Timothy to fulfill your ministry. The word fulfill means to discharge the duties of. Paul knew that it wasn't Timothy's place to replace him, but to follow his own course in obedience to God. But you know, like Paul, for many of us, there is a sacrifice that must be poured out in order for us to follow the path that God has laid out for us. And it begins with a surrendering of our will to His will. We say, God, my life is yours. I offer it to you freely, and I ask that your will be done in that life, not my own. And to be honest, for some people, that call to obedience is going to require... Well, it may require some sacrifice. There may be some dreams, some goals, some desires that occupy our thoughts, our energies. And God might actually ask us to give those up in order to do His will and to run the course that He has set for us. And let's be honest. That's hard. It's hard to give up some dream or desire that we've harbored. But you know what? It's better than the consequences of disobedience. It was about 16 and a half years ago, uh, late 2006, when it looked as if God was going to uproot us from our home uh, of 15 years in Oklahoma City to take us to a new ministry assignment in the city of Lubbock, Texas. Folks, that was not easy for us. But we sat down our kids and said, look, kids, God is calling us to something new, which means leaving our life here behind. But when God asks us to sacrifice something, it's because He's got something better. You know, maybe He's got dreams waiting for you that you haven't even conceived of yet. A better purpose, a better plan, a better outcome. But we still have to put our feet to the course that God has called us to. Now, in addition to this drink offering reference, I want you to notice something else here in verse 6. In addition to the drink offering, we see the departure occurring. Paul's life has been spent in service to the gospel. He writes, the time for my departure is close. Now, that Greek word for departure, it's often used to describe uh, breaking camp or the unyoking of an animal from the burden of the cart or the plow. Now, in Greek poetry, it's used in a more metaphorical sense. It's used to create the picture of a, of a ship that's hoisting anchor. It's loosening the mooring ropes and departing from one country to another country. Well, you see, Paul had been anchored and tied to this world, but the anchor 
and ropes of this world were now being loosed. And Paul was about to set sail for the greatest of all ports, heaven itself. Which brings so much more meaning to what he said in Philippians 1.21 when he said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul ran his course. Likewise, in fulfillment to our calling, we run the course. But then there's a second thing I want you to notice from our passage here. Not only do we run the course, but we reach toward completion. We reach toward completion. In fact, maybe a more descriptive word would be race toward completion. Understanding, of course, that the Christian life is not a sprint. It's a, it's a marathon. But Paul gives us a glorious testimony here. Look at verse 7. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So he quickly glances back over his life. He uses three word pictures to describe that life. The picture of a soldier, the picture of a runner, and the picture of a protector, a, a steward of the faith. So let's ponder those for a minute. Let's talk about Paul the soldier. He says he's lived his life out as a faithful soldier. I have fought the good fight, he says. One of my favorite quotes is from the, uh, the legendary Green Bay Packers coach, Vince Lombardi. He once said, I firmly believe that any man's finest hour, the greatest fulfillment of all he holds dear, is that moment when he has worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle victorious. I have fought the good fight, Paul says. The, the Greek verb there is agonizomai. Agonizomai, the root of that word, it's where we get our English word agony. But agonizomai, it means to struggle, to labor, to strive, to fight. Paul had responded to the call of the Lord Jesus. He'd sacrificed everything that he was to be a soldier, totally committed to the mission of Christ. He'd suffered through the threats and the scrapes and the attacks and the, the wars that were launched by the enemies of Christ. And he had fought the good fight. No ordinary fight. See, in our English vocabulary, good is so vague, it's kind of nebulous. But here in the Greek, it, 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 it refers to something that's worthy honorable, noble, excellent. I fought the honorable fight. Paul had done his time. He'd stuck to the mission of Christ at the very end. And so now Paul can victoriously declare, I have fought the good fight. And now he's being honorably discharged from his service as a soldier for the king. So we see Paul the soldier. We also see Paul the runner. Paul had completed the race of life, just like an athlete runs and finishes the course of his race. And, and the picture there is powerful. It, it tells us that Paul had disciplined his life to the, to the utmost. He was laser focused on that course of life and how he ran it. And he avoid, avoided being distracted by the things of the world and the, the things of the flesh so that he would not be disqualified from the race. And that's why he would be able to write in, in 1 Corinthians 9 24, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way as to receive the prize. Like a runner, he maintained his direction. He forged on even when he was weary. I recall what he wrote to the church at Philippi, Philippians 3.14. I press toward the mark. That word press, it means to strain. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We see Paul the runner. We also see Paul the protector. He says he'd kept the faith. All right, so what does that mean? What does it mean to, to keep the faith? Well, he uses a funny sounding Greek word there. The word is teterika. Teterika is actually in the perfect tense. So if you're a grammar Nazi, you know that that basically means it's a past action with a present ongoing implication. A past action with a present and ongoing 
implication. Now, in its dictionary form, to terika, it really means to guard, to keep, to, to watch, to observe. But in this particular context, it, it more literally means to, to hold on to something so as not to, to give it up or to, to lose it. Paul was a guardian of the gospel, a protector of the faith, and the implications of that are still ongoing today. He had looked after the faith, just like a good steward, looks after the estate and the affairs of his master, like a, like a trust, a management contract between Paul and Christ. The Lord had entrusted proclamation of the gospel to Paul, and he had proven faithful. Paul was both a proclaimer of and protector of the gospel until the day he died. Now think about that for a minute. All of the sufferings that he went through, the terrible trials, the times when he really came close to death, the times when he was in prison, the times when he really could have just dumped that trust of the faith, ignored it, tossed it aside. And yet Paul took what God had entrusted to him and he managed it through, through both good and bad times, never at any point forsaking the faith. In a speech that was delivered on October 29th, 1941, history buffs, you may recall this, Speaking to the boys at his old school, Harrow, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill once said, never give in. Never, 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 never. In nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Now, Paul says something similar regarding the Christian life in Galatians 6, 9. He says it more simply, but he says, Let us not become, <coughs> excuse me, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Understand what Paul is saying here. Stay the course. Give it your all. Strive for excellence in everything. Do not give up. The application is quite clear. Finish the race. I know some of you are thinking, I can't. I don't think I can do that, Eric. Derek Redmond was a sprinter. He was in Barcelona in 1992 to represent Great Britain at the Olympic Games. Derek enjoyed a wonderful relationship with his dad, Jim. And in the days following the race, Derek Redmond described how, as he settled into the starting blocks for the beginning of a semifinal race, his thoughts naturally turned to his dad and all of the support that Jim had provided him. The starter gun was fired. Derek got off to a clean start. He was running well. When coming out of the backstretch into the final curve, his right hamstring muscle tore. Derek crumpled to the track. A medical team with a stretcher began to rush to his aid. But something inside Derek Redmond said that he must finish the race. A hush enveloped the crowd as he struggled to climb to his feet and began to hobble torturously toward the finish. Every step racked his body with enormous pain. Suddenly, an older man eluded the Olympic security guards, jumped onto the track, ran to Derek's side. And as many of you have already guessed, it was his dad, Jim. And Derek began to sob as arm in arm, he and his father began to press toward the finish. Just before Derek reached the finish line, Jim let go, and Derek completed the course on his own, and this crowd of 65,000 people gave him a standing ovation. Now, does Derek Redmond's story remind you of anything? 
It reminds me of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where the writer of Hebrews says, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Oh, but Eric, I can't. I cannot live the way Paul did. You know what? You're absolutely right. In your own strength, you can't. You need assistance. You need assistance. You need a helper. Now, Derek Redmond's helper was his dad, but God has already given you a helper. Your helper is the Holy Spirit. Paul said in Ephesians 3.20 that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to His power that is at work within us. So no, alone, you can't finish the race. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, yes, yes you can. But not only do you need assistance, you need an aim. You need an aim. You need a vision, a goal, a, a target to set your sights on. Ask yourself, what have I set my sights on in this life? And then we come back to the words of the writer of Hebrews. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Remember the instruction that Paul has given us. We run the course. We reach toward completion. And here's the third thing I want you to notice. We regard the crown. Look at verse 8. Paul says, There is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Paul was to receive this crown of righteousness because he'd given his life to be a soldier for Christ and for his spiritual warfare, to be a runner for Christ and his course, to be a protector of the faith of Christ and, and of his gospel. Think about this. Paul was to be given this everlasting crown of righteousness because of his faithfulness. What a contrast with the, the fleeting fame and, and the, the fading, deteriorating crowns and trophies that this world has to offer. Two things that we notice about this crown. First of all, it's a crown from a righteous Lord. A crown of righteousness will be given by a righteous God, the Lord. The righteous and perfect judge. The only judge who knows the truth about all men. He's the only one who can award this crown. He knows the heart of all of us. And he's seen every one of us. Every day of our lives. He's seen everything that we've said. Everything that we've done. He knows every thought that we've ever thought. And he knows this about every person who's ever walked the face of this planet in the history of mankind. He knows it all. And the Lord knew all about Paul. His past, his present, his future. The Lord knew he'd been a good soldier. He'd been a runner. He'd been a, a keeper of the faith. But because the Lord is perfect and righteous, Paul knew that the Lord would give him the perfect crown of righteousness in that glorious day to come. So we see a crown from a righteous Lord, but we also notice a crown for a redeemed lover. What's that crown? The crown of righteousness. Something that God gives to those who are faithful to the end. Who are the redeemed? Those who've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. Who's the lover? The one who looks for his coming. The one who loves the Lord's appearing, Paul says in verse 8. The person who truly loves the Lord himself. Who truly believes 
in the Lord and in the glorious salvation that he has provided. Who's the true believer? The one who has repented of his sins and by faith has trusted in Christ for salvation and has committed his life to him. Who's the one who's really committed to Christ? Yeah, he, he or she's pretty easy to spot. The one whose fruit is evident. The person who, like Paul, is fighting for the cause of Christ. Running the course God has called him to run. And is a keeper of the faith. That's the person who loves and looks for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the person who's going to receive the crown of righteousness. Now, Paul didn't allow himself to get sidetracked by life's distractions and all of those things that compete for our attention, or even by the specter of his own imprisonment or his looming execution. Paul had set his eyes on the prize. Remember what he told the church at Colossae? Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, he said, Let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on earth. For you died when Christ died, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Folks, like Paul, we should look forward to the future reward that God has in store, the crown of righteousness that he has promised for those who are faithful until his coming. There's a common motivational technique. It's called self-visualization. Basically, self-visualization is, you know, in, in your mind, you're, you're imagining yourself doing something great, something significant, something productive, something worthwhile. Uh, research has shown that, uh, you know, surgeons, uh, musicians, business executives have used it to, to focus and to improve their performance. So self-visualization, you know, could maybe help you run a 5K or, or ace a presentation or help you avoid that box of Krispy Kreme donuts in the morning. You know, but for an athlete, you know, for athletes, you know, maybe it means going over the, the game plan in their minds, creating mental pictures of themselves, making big plays to help their team, team win the big game, or something like that. But maybe we, as servants of Christ, should spend some mental energy visualizing the goals that God is calling us to achieve. But all the while remembering he's the one who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is within us. Remember what Paul told Timothy in verse 5? Endure hardship. Do the work. Fulfill your ministry. We obediently do our part. We do the spiritual conditioning, presenting our lives as an offering, a sacrifice given to God, trusting Him to empower us to fulfill the calling that He's placed on our lives. But you see, it also helps to have a vision, to foresee what's to come, which for those of us who are in Christ, well, that's life eternal. See, if you're willing to run your course, to visualize your triumphant Savior and the crown that he holds for you, then like Paul, you know, when the, when the roller coaster circumstances of life come, you're not going to feel beat down. Remember who's guiding you down that course of a fruitful life, of significance this side of heaven, and, and to ultimate victory on the other side. Now think about this crown of righteousness for a minute. It's something that God has in store for those who are faithful to the end. We see it's a crown that a person can't receive unless they have been made acceptable to God. No person can ever be accepted by God unless he's covered with righteousness and made perfect. Why? Well, because God is perfect. He is holy, and only perfection can live in the presence of perfection. Only presence, the, the, the perfection can live in the presence of God because He is holy. The thing is, we're not. 
And there's nothing that we can do to earn perfection. In fact, Paul said in Romans 3.10 that there's nobody that's righteous, not even one. A few verses later, verse 23, he says that we've all sinned, every one of us, and come short of the glory of God. So what do we do about that? Well, the only way a person can become acceptable to God is by receiving, by faith, the gift of salvation that Christ has provided for us through his atoning death on the cross. And here's how awesome that was, that he paid the price for us. Because Paul says in Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to try to clean ourselves up and somehow achieve some level of perfection or goodness and then accept us. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. He paid the price. And yes, sin calls for a price. Paul said in Romans 6.23 that the wages of that sin is death. Separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He said, it's a gift. But we have to choose to receive it. God's given us a choice. Paul said in Romans 10, 13, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You ready to do that? If you've never come to that moment of decision where you've said yes to Jesus, are you ready to make that decision? 